Welcome to Catholic Courses. I am Dr. Monica Migliorino Miller, the professor of theology at Madonna University in Michigan. And in this course, we are going to discuss the development of the New Testament canon itself. The canon of the New Testament, uh, what we mean by that, of course, are the 27 books that comprise the sacred scriptures uh, for Christians and for the church. And it is literature that originates in the heart of the church. I think it's kind of important for us to understand <laughs> that when we're talking about scripture, this is not a, a piece of literature that just falls out of the sky. And, you know, some people have this um, kind of a uh, idea that it's the, you know, book that falls out of the sky and it's already got the ribbons on it and the gilt edges and it's ready to go with leather binding and so on. No. There is a long, uh, really uh, decades, even centuries um, worth of historical development when we're talking about why these 27 books and not others. We call, of course, uh, Scripture the Word of God. Um, what does this mean, the Word of God? Well, certainly uh, we are talking about God's own personal revelation to mankind. And Scripture is a special instance of this revelation of God to the human race, to the church, to his people. Vatican II has a very important document, the Constitution on Divine Revelation, otherwise known as Dei Verbum, Word of God. And in Dei Verbum, the Word of God is actually defined not simply as, as Scripture, whether Old Testament, New Testament, but is it really the Word of God comprises the entire deposit of faith revealed by God to his people. And that would include those doctrines, those teachings of God, the revelation of God that's not necessarily written down, so it would also include sacred tradition. And so in some ways we're really going to be seeing as we examine the development of the New Testament canon, we're really going to see how the word of God, the revelation of God to man in his written word and sacred tradition work together to produce this entire deposit of faith understood the whole Word of God. Now, the production of the Word. The church teaches that Scripture is divinely inspired. It is God's Word to man. And so, throughout the last 2,000 years, even actually dating way back into uh, the time of ancient Judaism, there are theories of how it is that God communicates his word, and then how is, it, how is that word actually committed to the written page? Probably the most popular theory, uh, and really the one that I, I would say has lasted well through the 19th century, is one of, what is understood as the trance, uh, well, the trance theory. Uh, the trance theory is that God kind of put the sacred author, the human being, into a kind of uh, trance-like state, and while the senses, the consciousness of the author was um, miraculously suspended, then the author writes uh, in, the, in this miraculous mystical condition, God's word. Now we're going to come back to that in just a second. It's certainly equal with the trance theory, and maybe in some ways uh, even super, you know, uh, going even beyond the popularity of the trance theory is the dictation theory. So here, the sacred author winds up being a kind of secretary. In fact, you'll even see wood carvings and bas-relief sculptures where you'll have the, the, uh, the, the, the sacred author writing at a desk, and then the the dove, the, the uh, symbol of the Holy Spirit, is actually talking <laughs> into the ear of the author. The third theory, uh, not so important, but still uh, was uh, somewhat considered, is understood as the, the stamp of approval theory. And here you have sort of God is, in, in this theory, sort of out of the picture, at least for a while. And you have the author, 
whether it's the author of the book of Genesis or the book of Exodus or in the New Testament, the, the four Gospels. The author writes, and then later on, God comes along and literally says, oh, I like that, and puts his stamp of approval on the writing. So it's sort of a after the fact um, approval, recognition, and then it gets adopted as sacred literature. As we get into the 19th century, there was a refinement, even I would say a sort of, maybe we could even say psychological sophistication that enters into what do we mean by divine inspiration. A lot of the credit goes to a um, theologian in the 19th century, M.J. Lagrange, uh, when at the end of the 19th century, he proposed what is understood as the theory of cooperation. And in the theory of cooperation, as the theory itself already sort of indicates, it's not just God on the one side dictating or putting the author into a trance, or the, or the human being all on their own writing it, and then later on God coming along and saying, I approve that, and so it gets elevated into sacred scripture. But there is an actual cooperation between God and man. This is a very important development. As you see in those earlier uh, theories, the human being is kind of really not part of the writing. The human being doesn't really actually contribute anything to the development of the text itself. Now, this is very important in terms of, well, we want to preserve the pristine, uh, infallible uh, nature of Scripture. It's the Word of God, and so man cannot be really part of it. And, and, and the idea here, of course, is that when, if man actually is part of the writing, well, it must somehow be tainted, right? Not the pure divine word of God if the human being actually makes a contribution. I have to say that um, M.J. Lagrange was, was really vindicated by Vatican II. When you take a look at the uh, document uh, on divine revelation, um, Article number 11 says, God chose men, and while employed by him, they made use of their powers and abilities, so that with him, acting in them and through them, they, as true authors, true authors, consigned to writing everything and only those things which God wanted. So the human being is an actual author, so there's a cooperation between God as the, what is understood as God as the principal author and man as the instrumental author, but actually contributing to the writing. And then lastly, uh, even into the 20th century, the idea that scripture is the product not of the single particular author, whether, whether it would be Moses or Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, St. Paul, and so on, but that these authors exist within an inspired community of faith. And so the books are actually produced ultimately by that community of which they are a part. And I think that's actually a very important development because there you actually see the intersection between scripture and the church. So, so there's an ecclesial, real, real solid ecclesial, ecclesial element in the production of the sacred books.